I'm Liz Stevens. And I'm Sarah Kate, and welcome to Disney Princess Deathmatch. 14 princesses enter, one princess leaves. Boom, boom, boom. Boom, 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 boom. It's so cool. Who thought of this? Those people are cool. They're cool people. We should be their <laughs> friends, and you all should be their friends, too. Find them, hug them. <laughs> Follow them on Twitter. Yes. <laughs> So this week, we are doing Sleeping Beauty, which came out in 1959. Wow. And was the end of the Renaissance era of Disney films. Is that right? Or am I thinking different? You're thinking different. Okay. I think I mean classic Disney then, don't I? Yes. Yes. It was the end of classic Disney as Mm -hmm. we know it, basically, until the Disney Renaissance in 80, whenever Little Mermaid came out. 89 is when Little Mermaid came out. Yep. A year after I did. And I knew all the songs to that film when I was like a year and a half old. And that's why Disney Renaissance always seemed like a weird term to me because I was like, that's classic Disney to me. Right. (laughs) It's been there since I was a child. Mm -hmm. But now it's like, oh no, you mean old school Disney. That's okay. That's That's classic. classic. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So last week we talked about how Cinderella uh, was the make or break film for Walt Disney. That's right. And it was. Looks like he made it. Yeah. He totally. (laughs) Good job. (laughs) You did it, Walt. Walt Disney? Who's that guy? <laughs> He's a household name now. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, now we're moving on to Sleeping Beauty. Um, one of the, o- well, I was about to say one of the only films that is not named for the princess's name herself, but that's ridiculous because The Little Mermaid is not called Ariel and Tangled is not called Rapunzel and Frozen True is not called story. Anna and Elsa. So what do I know? <laughs> My son just calls it Princess. There he you wants go. to watch Princess with me. That's like, really excellent. Good it's job. It's been pretty darling. We've seen it lots of times. So Awesome. Well, why don't you go ahead and get started? I know that you were bragging to me the last three days about all of the information that you had gleaned about yes. this film. Yes. Well, here's the thing. When we bought it on Amazon, which was by accident, actually, my yep. son bought it for us. And we're like, oh, <laughs> this was expensive. We should mm, keep it forever, it turns out. So we've watched it lots of times. And when I first pulled it up, and you remember you were over here, mm-hmm. and we're like, two hours and 55 minutes. This is a long movie. Well, and is it of two course, hours and no, 55? No, 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 no. Okay, that okay. was all of the extra materials at oh, the end. Yeah. Oh, that's right. So, yeah, because we both were like, there's no way that this is a three hour long impossible. film. Impossible. No way. No. Especially because we were coming right after Cinderella, and Cinderella was like 57 minutes. Yeah, or something Cinderella's tiny. super short. Yeah. Uh, and Snow White was like, what, an hour and a half or something like that? Almost two hours? Not that long, even, I don't think. Okay. It was longer than I was expecting, though. Yeah. It was longer, I think, than Cinderella was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So far, Cinderella has been the shortest. So, but but this one, they really went all out as far as, like, they changed the whole animation style. Really? And, yeah. And you notice more, like, as soon as someone says it, it becomes obvious. Mm-hmm. But, like, the backgrounds are so detailed they're so detailed that people were worried at first that the characters weren't going to show very well up against these super detailed backgrounds oh, how interesting yeah which i found out was because the main um the, the guy who did the art direction mm-hmm. his name was ivan something i've already forgotten but he was super cool and he had gone to europe and seen all of this like renaissance artwork oh, and okay. that's what had inspired everything that he wanted to do on Sleeping Beauty. And mm-hmm. so if you look at tapestries, you realize how close they are in their art design. Sarah's looking at the tapestry in my house right now and saying, oh my God, you're right. Yeah, no, she totally is. Yeah, yeah. Th- th- you'll see just there's so there's a lot of detail. There's right. a lot of um, flora and fauna. <laughs> and right. Meriwether. Ah. Uh, I didn't even mean to do that. But anyway... <laughs> Well, I mean, like, you'll see those posts on the internet all the time of, like, all these, like, sig- secret, like, hidden, like, dirty jokes and things oh, that are yeah. in Renaissance paintings if you look in the background and stuff. And so, yeah, like, the guys who did those were, I mean, you're spending, what, I mean, hours and hours, days, possibly weeks on a painting. I also would throw in some, you know, fart jokes if I could make it happen. <laughs> I mean, golly. Well, I just can't believe how much detail was paid to this film. Mm-hmm. and ju- And it's really... At, at the time, it didn't do super well in the box office. It did all right. Okay. But it was it was kind of a letdown mm-hmm. to everybody, especially after all of the time and all the effort that they had put into it. Because Cinderella had come out nine years prior yes. in 1950. And so then almost a decade later, this film came out. And so, yeah, I can see how that would be kind of a shocker for it not to do yeah. quite as well. Well, and it's not that it did poorly, just just that it was it was a letdown. You know, it, was, right. it, just, it mm-hmm. wasn't what they had hoped that it would be, especially after they had... It was so modern mm-hmm. at the time, you know, because it was so artistic, much right. more so than the, than the other shows had been. But uh, now, of course, it's known as one of the great animated films of all time. Well, that's really interesting. Yeah. Did you watch this one a lot whenever you were little? Yeah, I sure did, because me and my sister used to fight over whether her dress was blue or pink at the end. 
And I want to say that I actually fought for pink when I was a girl, although I've since changed my mind. I like the blue dress better. Oh, yeah. This is like that blue and black, white and gold thing all over again, isn't it? <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> I do not think that this uh, movie was on my roster of films that we watched uh, whenever we were younger. Like when we were watching Cinderella, I had mentioned about how it got started. And then suddenly I remembered everything yeah, about it. Yeah. When we watched Sleeping Beauty... I remembered nothing. It was like a brand new film. It was film. like a whole new film for me. It was as though I had never seen the movie before in my life, and I just, I did not remember a single lick of it. It was crazy. I feel like this movie uh, was a little bit slower, especially kind of in the beginning. Like, I felt like the credits kind of took a long time, and it kind of well, took a Well, there's long... a lot of exposition, right? At yes. the beginning, the storytelling thing mm-hmm. kind of goes on for a while. It does, and I think that um, <laughs> for those of you who are friends of the show and maybe know me pretty well, you could probably imagine time need two-year-old Sarah, you know, having difficulty <laughs> keeping up with something that isn't just bombastic right out of the right out of the gate there. Um, but yeah, I didn't remember this movie at all. There was so much about this movie that was um, shocking and surprising to me. And yeah. uh, well, not shocking and surprising, but I was just like, oh, OK, I didn't know that was going to happen. So, well, it starts out with that beautiful golden book, which is yes. super iconic to me. Like that, mm-hmm. that's the one that I think of when I think of the classic Disney opening, I think, is that super the golden book engraved with all the jewels and the gems right and stuff. yeah and it's like mm-hmm. a flickering waxy candle next mm-hmm. to it and this was the last book opening that we had until enchanted I think so. I yeah. Think. yeah yeah and i don't and snow white didn't start with a book opening i noticed today when i was rewatching that oh did it not so it was only cinderella and sleeping beauty and yet it was so iconic huh that's weird how you just make those associations it's true mm-hmm. and maybe some of the other ones that, that don't have princesses did mm-hmm. like it's possible that peter pan and pinocchio and those ones that came in between because there were other movies you know, in I between have no idea i haven't seen Peter Pan in a long time and I don't remember the last yeah. time I saw Pinocchio. Hmm. It could be. I don't know. It's been a long time for me too. Yeah. So. Let us know on Twitter if you know. Tell us. <laughs> but anyhow, so so then we start with the big opening pageantry in the parade mm-hmm. and they're singing, you know, Hail to the King, which really isn't the super best song ever it's it's neat but it's pretty forgettable and it's, yeah. and it's busy. There's mm-hmm. lots of banners, lots of color, lots of things going on. It's not true 3d but it feels 3d you know right. got the people crossing and mm-hmm. stuff so it was it was a spectacle yeah and i'm not sure if we've mentioned this before but i do remember um like just all of the chorus songs never catching my interest as a child and oh, even as yeah. an adult and seeing those i'm just like oh, i'm having difficulty hearing what the words are i can't uh-huh. really follow along it's just it's it difficult to hard hear. to understand those yeah. words like mm-hmm. if you didn't grow up listening to perry coma with your dad like i did it's really hard to and and even Nat King Cole more than Perry Como, I should say. <laughs> but anyhow, but you get used to those like choral voices in the background right. and having mm-hmm. to make out what they're saying. But it's a practiced ear for I, sure. I'm sure. Yes. And I did not have that thing. Well, then we go to the big princesses. I don't know if it's a coronation or everybody has come to see the new princess. I think it's just her birth, right? Just, I mean, yeah, she's just in general. Yeah. Not her birthday, but right. just come and pay homage to the new yes. princess Aurora. Mm-hmm. Right. So... Which is a great scene because you really see just, I mean, you can see every brick in that palace. Somebody hand drew. Wow. And they do this beautiful thing where the the, the fairies come, mm-hmm. Flora, Fauna, and Meriwether come down. Mm-hmm. And they start to present their gifts, right? Yes. And she's gifted with beauty and song right from the beginning. Mm-hmm. But there's this beautiful, it's a, a song plays, you know, the gift of song or whatever. Right. And it does this whole it's almost like trippy <laughs> where you get, you know, um, it's very artistic. The birds are, right. are passing by. There's like the constellations. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of color going on. It was a drawing. Yeah, it was yeah. very reminiscent of Fantasia. I yes. felt like. Yes. yes. Mm-hmm. It was very reminiscent Which, of Fantasia. Uh, recently, earlier this year, got released back into theaters because <gasps> they were doing like the 75th anniversary of it. I know that. I have I no idea. I would love to go to that. Oh my gosh. It was a lot of fun. Like that wasn't like wow. we did have Fantasia when we were younger and I remember yeah. watching that one and it was another one that didn't catch my attention quite as much but as an adult going I mean uh, uh, dad and my brother David and I went to go see it and um, David and I of course hadn't seen it since we were yeah. very small children Yeah. Um, but we remembered most of it but we remembered it mostly like boring us we were basically going because dad wanted to go and we were like yeah okay that sounds great and then we went and both of us were just like this is amazing it is so 
cool. Yeah. And it's amazing how timeless it is. Mm -hmm. I could not believe when they told me how early that movie came out. Yeah, it really is timeless. I mean, it was really incredible. I think that I was even at some point like moved to tears at one point because the music was so beautiful and the animation was so cool and all of that. So yeah, if you haven't watched my all time favorites. Yeah. If you have not watched Fantasia in a long time, Mm -hmm. I recommend going ahead and watching that film again because it's way cooler than you remember it being. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, we used to watch it all the time growing up because my mom didn't mind it being in the background because it's mm-hmm. all the beautiful music, you know? Right. That makes so, total sense. Yeah. And that was nap time every day when mm-hmm. she wanted us, because she ran a daycare. When she wanted us to sleep, we would put on Fantasia. That's brilliant. And some of the kids would knock out, you know, usually around the dinosaurs. Yeah. Whoa. That was my favorite part. That <laughs> was the sure part that was, got me as a but kid. But it's just like the music too, between the music and the mm-hmm. fact that it's not as, it's it's not as narrative. It's, right. It's not as much of a story. It's as very some conceptual of the other at that are. point. It is yes. very conceptual. Mm-hmm. Yes. And so when you're a kid, it's just like, ah, oh, lots I of I do orange. remember always being kind of sad that the T-Rex just straight up mauled that poor Stegosaurus though. Yeah. I was always like, oh, yeah. this is hard to watch. <laughs> uh, so anyway, Sleeping Beauty. Um, and, well, all that to say that Sleeping Beauty, the artistic directors really did take a lot of inspiration from Fantasia, mm-hmm. particularly. Do you remember like that kind of the weird demonic thing from the end with all of the little goblins dancing? Yes, in the fire? absolutely. Yeah, you can um, absolutely see where they borrowed what from that from call Maleficent. Like a, I don't, it's like Faust's whatever or yes, something. Yeah, yes. mm-hmm. uh-huh. but they borrowed from that from Maleficent and for oh, all of her little cronies and demons and things. Yeah, and I think they even borrowed actual frames and drew over them they very well may have because that was a thing that they did a lot um um I don't know if that is what they call rotoscoping or if rotoscoping is whenever you film an actor or actress doing a thing and then you draw over them Mm -hmm. to animate. But anyway, you can see it a lot. Like you've probably seen online those pictures of uh, Christopher Robin and Winnie the Pooh walking down the log. And then it's also Mowgli from the Jungle Book walking down the log. And it's (gasps) that same kind of thing. They do it again with uh, Robin Hood and something else I can't remember what it is but where they would take these um, drawings that they had already done and just paint over them Mm -hmm. and create these new scenes for these various different movies very smart Um, I thought that Maleficent was legitimately (sighs) scary Maleficent is my all-time favorite Disney villain. If we really? were doing Disney villain deathmatch right now, Maleficent would be taking oh, the Oh, man. Do we need to eventually do a Disney villain deathmatch? Uh, sure. I, okay, I'd that be sounds that great. Yeah, all right. My two favorites are Maleficent and actually Scar. I somehow knew that you were going to say that thing. I wonder how. That's huh. it. I didn't even know that until I was thinking about it the huh. other day. Because they were talking about... The animation of villains and mm-hmm. how all the animators want to do the villains. Well, yeah, the villains are the most interesting. I, I think that we and maybe that's talk- not always been the case, right? But we, yes, mm-hmm. I was just going to say, but Walt Disney was very emphatic that your villains be human, that you make them interesting, that they're not just evil incarnate, that there's something about them that is compelling. Well, way to go, Walt! Like way right? to know how to like properly tell stories and uh-huh. be able to present those. That's really cool. Yeah, I thought that Maleficent was legitimately terrifying. She shows mm-hmm. up in this grand hall she hasn't been invited to she's like the wicked fairy or right. whatever and hasn't so been cool. invited to um the princess's coronation and she's just so soft and so sly isn't the word but just very I know subtle just what you're saying yeah, yeah yeah she's like smooth she's a she's smooth very operator dignified yes mm-hmm. yeah and uh everybody clearly is very scared of her particularly yes. the king and queen um mm. and she oh man she got so ticked off um the movie Maleficent that came out recently did not do this character justice. We See, don't have to talk about the live action. Disney. Excellent, because we're not. We're, <laughs> we're only not. doing yeah. the films, uh, the Disney cartoon films. The Disney animated classics. Exactly. Right. Um, yeah. But yeah, I thought that she was legitimately scary. She is an excellent villain. Very, excellent. very good. Yeah. Yes. She was uh, She was animated by Mark Davis, who was known for doing the the beautiful princesses you know he mm-hmm. had he had worked on cinderella okay and they knew that they wanted him to work on aurora as mm-hmm. well so he had drawn aurora and they weren't certain that they were going to give him maleficent until they decided that they did want her to be beautiful mm-hmm. which she is i mean she's she's got harsher features right but she does have a, a beauty and a, and a glamour mm-hmm. about her like she's very striking she has very striking yes. features yeah and I mean, I find her fascinating anyway, but, mm-hmm. but she is 
attractive to watch you know she's I not like an you. old haggard you know villain. right it's been really interesting um you know i i'm thinking about this you know beautiful character that is maleficent like yes. she's she's an attractive woman i mean she's got kind of the green skin thing going on but whatever <laughs> and it reminds me of the wicked queen in snow white who also was not just like an, a, a vile look i mean she right. she turned into the old hag in the film but i mean right. she herself was a very beautiful woman mm-hmm. and it's just really interesting that they chose to take these these characters who these women who were so beautiful but on the inside they're like really evil and twisted yes, and dark you're right. and you're so right it was kind of neat that they have that you're right because i think people give um the princesses or the whole like disney princess idea kind of a little bit of flack because they're like oh what are they but pretty you know yes but mm-hmm. the villains could be really beautiful too and it's yeah. showing that it's more than that you know beauty is more than skin deep it, it's right. showing that, that that really is a part of this kind of right story exactly telling. these princesses are generally and we'll get to the ones who aren't necessarily <laughs> uh, these princesses are generally as beautiful inside yes. as they are on the outside Absolutely. but these these villains are certainly not like yes. they're very beautiful in appearance very alluring very striking like what you're yeah. saying but then they're they're evil they yeah. got bad intentions and evil intentions and I do wish that we had kind of a a better origin story for Maleficent because I believe that her her real story uh, can I say that I just did so <laughs> I, I feel like her real story would be very compelling and interesting to probably see probably very fascinating mm-hmm. yeah now speaking of drawing those comparisons did you recognize any voices is Maleficent the same voice as the Evil Queen in Snow White no, no. there's like a decade like twenty year difference. Uh, did she play Madame Tremaine or Lady Tremaine in she Cinderella? She was Lady Tremaine. Yeah. Yep. So that voice is the same, uh, which I, I did know that. And then, um, Flora, mm-hmm. the, the good fairy in the That's pink. That's right. She's the fairy the godmother. She is absolutely yes. the fairy godmother. Mm-hmm. Yes. And she, she's very recognizable. If you're not in the room and you hear her talking, you think it's the fairy godmother talking. Yeah, oh, that's absolutely. so funny. And then, but the one that really threw me, someone had to tell me, I did not pick up on it at all, is Meriwether. Meriwether is the voice of Lady from Lady and the Tramp. What? And as soon as you know that, you cannot unhear it. <laughs> Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, that's crazy. That's super cool. It was so neat. Which fairy, by the way, Sarah, is your favorite? Which one do you relate to the most? Oh, gosh. I think that I relate the most to probably Meriwether. I think Meriwether is your spirit fairy. If she that's a might thing. be. <laughs> that was a totally loaded question. I was leading the witness. <laughs> Are you begging the question? Is that I what you're doing? <laughs> oh, Alistair will be so pleased. We did we use that right? Etymology. I have no idea. <laughs> if we did it wrong, don't tell him. <laughs> anyway. Why do you think that? That makes me really happy, but explain it to me. <laughs> you know, oh, gosh. That puts me on the spot. I don't know if I necessarily could, but she's just, she's a little bit feisty. She doesn't like being told what to do. Mm-hmm. She has good ideas most of the time. Mm-hmm. You know, she's just, uh, I, I don't know. She's from I also me of feel you. like whenever it gets to the part where the fairies have been raising Aurora for the last 16 yes. years, Meriwether is literally the only one who like knows what is going on and like right? how to care for a child. Flora and Fauna are running around and like, like her giant cake is like melting uh, to pieces yeah. and the other one's trying to make this dress and it looks like a lampshade had a baby with a curtain <laughs> and it's just it's terrible i don't know how yeah. they survived in the wild for so long <laughs> it's a miracle that aurora survived to her 16th birthday maleficent swoops in and then because she's so mad about not being yeah. invited to this party curses aurora and says on her right. 16th birthday she's going to prick her finger on the needle of a spinning wheel and what do her parents do completely logically they send her off to the woods and completely just trust that everything's going to be right. dory and super cool and really great and burn all the burn spinning all wheels. the spinning don't wheels that note so now i don't know anything in ab- society it'll I, be yeah. fine <laughs> i don't know anything about sewing or anything like that i don't know about making clothes do they have looms i guess do you need a spinning wheel to get to a loom like i don't i don't I know feel like clearly it probably was important but maybe they had like fabric hoarders and they had just been yeah. years like it just hoarding fine. fabric yeah. so I mean, it was, was like a depression sort of yeah i guess so I anyway i'm sure it was fine <laughs> disney parents making bad decisions strike one right here <laughs> sleeping beauty we'll see how far that continues as we go on fauna is based on a real person which no i way. thought was 
adorable because so? she's the cutest in my I, fauna is my favorite of the fairies is she the green one so or the red she's one? the green one. okay yeah okay. fauna is the green one and she's just i've already adorable. forgotten <laughs> she's the one who um remember when the fairies first they fly away after you know when they come up with the idea basically mm-hmm. and they fly into that little it's like a jewelry box oh and yeah it's they shrunk down mm-hmm. illustrated they shrunk down they go into that little jewelry box and you see all of the gems and like the goblets and chalices it's gorgeous right. And Fauna is the one who's talking about Maleficent. And she says, you know, sometimes I don't think she's very happy. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, Fauna, you are the most adorable person. (laughs) You are so so cute. cute. (laughs) Oh, gosh. She's super cute. But apparently she was based on someone that that, uh, one of the illustrators had met in uh, or one of the writers had, had met in Colorado who was just adorable and it was like you were the sweetest kindest slightly dottiest person i've ever met (laughs) that's amazing so then yeah we end up off in the forest and suddenly magically years have passed and she is 16 looking like 26 right right? yeah i guess drawing kids is hard i mean okay no i i'm not even guessing i know drawing kids is hard because i have several friends who have small children and they have requested before that i draw pictures of their small children and let me tell you it is very difficult to just like capture a three-year-old's face without making them look anywhere yeah. from like seven to 12. You know, it's just, it's hard to do. Okay. Fair enough. Um, but yeah, definitely, definitely does not look 16. Right. Well, and she was voiced by Mary Costa, who I is, should know that name. Uh, should you? That's Shouldn't the only I? thing I know of her from. Really. Oh. Yeah. She did some operatics. She sang for the Met for a while. Well, that's cool. And yeah. And she was also very beautiful. So, so some of the animation was based on her actual self also. Oh, well, excellent. Is, Pretty darn cool. When mm-hmm. Walt Disney is like, I need someone to be my muse for a princess. You, child. <laughs> you look and sound like a princess. Can you imagine what that phone call is like? I would die. The best phone call the ever? The best phone call. Yeah. Anyway. So, but some of the animators and stuff, the people who had, or, or rather people who had worked on the show and who were talking, you know, re- remembering, were saying that um, although Aurora is a princess, mm-hmm. she really had a queen-like presentation oh, like she how interesting really, yeah like like she had that kind of um presence in a room and she had that kind of voice because of course snow white had been like super girly and yeah right, she was yeah. not her favorite and then nope. cinderella you know kind of toned things down a little bit. i love cinderella's voice but and mary costa even took it to another level where it was like this she really didn't sound like a princess she sounded very queenly she had a very beautiful professional voice. Yeah. yeah i do remember very much enjoying her singing voice like yeah. I, I remember being surprised because i just assumed that everything prior to jody benson as ariel was just terrible um oh, no. in my memory um not but so. clearly that's not the case at all mm-hmm. no uh, mary costa did an excellent job with the singing here yeah if anything i found that her voice was so beautiful and so um mature mm-hmm. that it was kind of at odds with the character yeah and of aurora right which i guess we're to that point now yeah now we're meeting aurora first impression sarah again I don't know how this girl survived 16 years in the wilderness. This girl should have died probably like (laughs) seven times over. We don't even need to wait for the magic spinning wheel that's going to prick her into eternal sleep. Like this girl is just going to (laughs) die. A little secret out there for all of our listeners. We actually watched Sleeping Beauty first before we saw Snow White and Cinderella. We ended up watching them out of order, but now we're trying to like catch up and watch these things in order. But I just remember being so surprised at how, how do I describe this um even though mary costa may have had a very queenly personality and like a very queenly presence and all of that i felt like aurora was an accident waiting to happen she is a little bit ditzy can we say yeah flighty i I think it's a good one what like like, i don't know i feel like ditzy might have like a sexist connotation to it right i think that flighty is probably okay yeah yeah, she just maybe just a little a little dim We'll go with dim. That sounds like good. That. The girl is dancing through the forest, talking right. with all of her animal friends. She also can control all forest creatures with the sound of her voice, Naturally. much like yes. Snow White. Um, Which is lovely. Mm-hmm. It's just that's what you get as a Disney princess. That's just a control <laughs> that you have. Yeah, she was. she's going through and she's singing her song. And I remember being impressed by her song. But again, I'm like, girl, you are 16 years old. You've been holed up in this little cottage for yep. the last 16 years with these three women who are your aunties? 
Is that what she said? That's what she says. Yeah. Yeah. Uh And um, suddenly singing about you've been dreaming about this prince. Of course you have, because it's the 1950s. (laughs) And women's women can do. (laughs) Yeah. If you're a woman in the 1950s or sooner, your job is to marry rich and have lots of babies. Unless you're Peggy Carter, but that's not this Mm -hmm. podcast. No, unfortunately. Um, Yeah, I think that Dim and Flighty are both very good. I was not the girl's not getting a lot of points for autonomy or attitude, is what I'm saying. No. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, even like I was watching it with Lily, you know, and Lily is 10 now. Mm-hmm. And she's like, stranger danger much? Come oh my on. Gosh. Do not tell this guy where you live. You've known him <laughs> 10 minutes. I live in the cottage in the forest. Come find me there. No. Right? No, dude. Yeah. yeah. Lily is like, Prince Philip is really creepy, mom. <laughs> I'm like, I know. He absolutely he was. Yeah. yeah. That is another one of and these problems. sneaking up behind her. He keeps grabbing her hand. And yeah. Lily was like, she's trying to pull her hand away. And he keeps grabbing her hand. I'm like, no, you're right. It's not okay. This prince does not this take no for an not answer. all right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's not a really great man. Uh, one of the other things that's kind of a problem with these early Disney films is that the the women who are voicing the Disney princesses, uh-huh. e- even though we know, you know, in reality, they are women, we can hear their voices and think, okay, you're, you're like in your right. early 20s Obviously. or you're a teenager or whatever. Yeah. When these like... 1950s men's men jump up to voice these princes the guy sounds like 35 <laughs> all right there's no way that that is like an 18 year old prince this is a like a, a fully grown man i was yeah. about to say a swear word um but no this is a fully grown man chasing after this 16 year old girl yeah, and it's it's, it's it's really disconcerting to hear later on and you're just like i feel kind of creepy about this i don't really like it <laughs> what did you think of this song uh, Once Upon a Dream. Once Upon a Dream. Uh-huh. I had completely forgotten that that oh, song really? was in this movie. Yes. Oh my gosh. That song totally earworms me all the time. That's really funny. It gets stuck in there just for days. Yeah. Um, I thought that it was fine. Again, I was like with Lily kind of worried a little bit about mm-hmm. how much Aurora was trying to get away from this guy and he is just not having any of it. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you just can't look away. It's like just, a train yeah, wreck. Yeah, seriously. Uh, <laughs> what is going on here? It was a fine enough song. I can't recite any of the lyrics for you right oh, now really? except one. Well, no, I I know you. I walked with you once upon a dream. That's, there you go. Yeah. Is that the whole song? No. Are you sure? I'm positive because okay. I know all the words. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> See, as far as I know, it's just that refrain repeated ad nauseum. Right, right. Well, the fascinating thing about that song is that, and, and really the all of the music for this show was not created for this movie. Did you know that? What? This is, okay. I thought that you might not know this. Okay. The, the music from this movie and the whole concept from this movie came from a ballet. It's Tchaikovsky. It's Tchaikovsky's Sleeping Beauty. Yes. Yes. So there are little interludes that were created for the movie just to help, you know, uh, stitch the little scenes together for transitions. and Right. Things. And there were a couple of other numbers that were added. But for the most part, they took existing melodies and they added words or they expounded upon them. That is so but interesting. That's why, if you notice, there is music underneath the entire film. Huh. Just like the ballet. And it's very much, I, I mean, it, it absolutely changes the tone from, from scene to scene. Like when Maleficent right. is there, the Maleficent music, the Sleeping Beauty music, the mm-hmm. Prince music, the Kings, all of that is, is very much, it's storytelling through the music. That makes a lot of sense, actually, because now I'm thinking, now with that knowledge in my brain, I'm thinking about this film, and it's very much like, this is going to sound stupid when I say it because it's obviously no, no, a no. musical, but like right. it makes it seem like like a stage musical, like a stage play. Like you've got yeah. the stuff that's going on and just these transitory scenes in between the swelling music and everything. It mm-hmm. it, it plays very much like a ballet, but yes. with words. That's yeah. really cool and that's really interesting. Absolutely. That was one of the things that was really hard when they started when they first were were going to make it onto like Blu-ray and, mm-hmm. and onto DVD because they uh, the sound quality is so good now. Right. But the sound quality then was really bad. Correct. So they were, they had to remaster it, you know, and mm-hmm. they were finding that there were all these like crackles and pops and there were just Having problems. delved into some audio editing recently, yes. I can only imagine the nightmare that that must have been. So oh my gosh. They were concerned. They were like, I'm how sure. are we going to do this? How? Because you can hear everything right. on Blu-ray, right? You can hear the second violinist coughing into yes. his elbow. <laughs> <laughs> At the time when they were going to do it, and, and Walt Disney was like, this has to be the film. This is the new biggest, best thing that anyone has ever done in animated film. Right. So I- instead of recording in the States, they recorded the, uh, the ballet music. Mm-hmm. They had the orchestra perform it in Germany because that was the best recording studio in the world. That is so interesting. Yeah. So they found in the vaults at Disney, you know, wherever people were poking around in the basement, those original (laughs) recordings 
like all the way through the false starts and like the mess ups and the one more time from the top. And the guy was like, I swear to you, I could hear people's clothes rustling. I could hear them clear their throat before they, he said it was amazing. So he got to go through and remaster the whole thing and bring all that music in. Wow. And it was so interesting to see. Sometimes I just take for granted how many different kinds of creative people and how many different kinds of creative minds are necessary Mm -hmm. to make something that's truly genius something that that, that's really um something that really speaks to all of your senses Mm -hmm. in the way that we take for granted that that this movie in particular does but i was watching this guy talk about how in in this scene when when philip first hears aurora singing you Uh know she's kind of doing the little trills in the background right? right and he turns the horse and he's like did you hear that and starts riding towards the princess and I noticed this because the guy was like, listen for it. And you'll find that he was absolutely right. Even just in my house with my, you know, we've got a sound bar or whatever. So it's, sure. it's fairly fancy, but it's not super fancy. We don't have surround sound or anything like that. Yeah. But you'll find that when he first hears Aurora's voice, it's in your right ear. And then the Prince Philip turns his horse to the right and he gallops off for a little while. And then she sings again and you hear it in your left ear. Oh, that's really turns interesting. His horse to the left. And the closer he gets to her, the more the, the music and her voice starts to surround you. And you oh, get the full that's auditory really sensation. cool. Isn't that amazing? That's really neat. I'm just so impressed. And I have to say that I, I didn't realize, I don't know if it's just ignorance or if it was maybe even a form of snobbery, but I don't think I gave that sort of thing credit where where that credit is due and the same thing with the illustrations Mm -hmm. for some reason i never thought of animators and illust i i I think of animators as illustrators but i don't think of them as artists Okay. Does that make sense? Or that I didn't does make before. Sense. Right. Yeah, I'm glad you're correcting yourself right? now. <laughs> no, I'm, I am finding out that, holy smokes, there is so much that goes into uh, as they're playing with these characters to make them just right. And everything that they think about in the costuming and then mm-hmm. the coloring choices is absolutely artistry. And the guy particularly who did the, the majority of this, you know, I was talking about how he painted like every frame right. and he would teach the people who were helping him this is how I paint. So it's all going to look the same. This is how I oh do the my details gosh, that's of the insane. trees. Insane, right? Talk about your artist, though. This guy, first of all, he had a really tragic upbringing. We're going to skip that because I want to stay happy. But sounds how good. cool is this? When he was a teenager, 19 years old, and this reminds me of our friends Vinton and Tessa. This sounds like something that they would do, only maybe in a Volkswagen and not on a bicycle. <laughs> but this guy took a bicycle from LA to New York. What? Rode his bicycle at 19, made he he did a painting a day while he was on the road of wherever he stopped. And then when he got to New York, he had a gallery show with all of the uh, things that he had drawn uh, for those 42 days. It took him sold every piece. It only takes 42 days to bike from L.A. to New York. If you're Ivan, what's his name? Yeah, that's for insane. Sure. Ivan, the coolest dude. Ivan, the coolest. That's your name. There illustrator. You yeah, wow, that artist, is ridiculous. Animator. Amazing. So cool. How did he carry yeah. all of those paintings on his bike? I can't, I don't, I can't even, I don't, I don't know. know. I don't, I don't know. know. It's That's just ridiculous. amazing. Yeah. Wow. I, I was just floored by that. And he had made a great living before he had done this by doing, he was very modern, people mm-hmm. said, you know, he did Christmas cards and things mm-hmm. like that. And even at, like he always made his living with his artwork. And that is no one insane. doubted for a moment that he was an artist. Wow. Yeah. Way to go, Ivan. Right. I want to be like you when so I grow cool. up. That was legitimately very interesting. Thank you for sharing all that You're with me. welcome. Yeah, As really I was cool. watching, I was like, I can't wait to tell Sarah this. <laughs> it was so neat. So since we talk about, since one of the points is, is her attire, what do you think of her little peasant dress that we first see her in? I actually quite like it. Right? It looks I really, really comfortable. I like it. <laughs> it looks really, I mean, like, people would wear that today and look really great, right? I mean, it looks like... Uh, I mean... Here's the thing. When I see that dress, what I because she's got, like, those flowy white sleeves, and then she's got that black, like, bodice thing she's right over bodice, it. the bodice, yeah. The bodice and, is what kind of takes it out of, out of modern times. Well, yes. I, stay with me here, and here's what I mean when I say they would wear it today. Okay. What I actually mean is that, like, she is halfway to a steampunk cosplay, right? Like, if you're doing, like, your... Victorian steampunk era or whatever with the flowy. I mean, imagine if she had like some goggles and a top hat and like some leather boots. Okay. All right. Yeah. yeah I see what you're saying. Then. That probably, yeah. I mean, that it has nothing to do with like her outfit actually, like, today, here but. in the film. But <laughs> no, I thought it was quite, quite darling. Yes. Okay, no, Way better than Snow White's stupid peasant outfit. I really don't <laughs> well, like Snow White, so you guys. She was so ragged. <laughs> she looked so bad. So then she runs home. 
and she yep, says, which was really oh, dumb. I've, I've met the love of my life. Oh, this part. Yeah. 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 And oh then my Flora's gosh. like, you must never see that young man again. Yeah. They should have been honest with her from the get go. They really should have been. Maybe or waited till they got to the castle or something. It was just bad timing. All it around. really was. And I mean, I don't what know. happened to the party idea? Yeah. <laughs> Well, if only we could do Anastasia. <laughs> I know. But we can't because it's owned by Fox. Although apparently Disney is doing She's a live Disney. action version of Anastasia, but we're not doing live action films. Oh, you didn't know that? No. Yeah, they Disney totally do that. Not Fox. I don't understand. Th- they bought the rights because <gasps> Disney owns because everything. They're like, we should have done this. Yeah. <laughs> we made a mistake. Um, wow. Okay. She's a drama queen in this moment. She super duper yeah. is. I mean, she like immediately flings herself to her bed and is like weeping profusely, sobs, right? Yeah. It's like, you've known this guy. guy long enough to sing a verse and a chorus with him yeah. okay and also you kept telling him no and he kept not listening right? to you she has creeper. stockholm syndrome it was like super <laughs> quick onset stockholm syndrome from the prince could have been <laughs> they don't even know each other's names i mean listen i've never been good at like this whole dating thing but i assume <laughs> that you have to let the other person know what your name is at some point right unless Absolutely. it's like an illicit affair or something i don't know <laughs> So they take her back to the castle to, to meet She's her so mother and despondent. father. She's absolutely despondent. And then you get that, you know, the weird, eerie, ah, or whatever that's going on. And yeah. On. It turns out when they went looking and listening to those files, it's actually saying Aurora. Aurora. Really? Yes. It's huh. totally calling her name, which is infinitely creepier and awesomer. So I wish Why that we Why didn't they just that. leave that? I don't. No, maybe it is there, and we still and we just, just don't hear it. We just don't hear it very well because that's we, really interesting. Know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, this is also where Maleficent super duper cheats with her curse absolutely and is like, she does. "Oh, like hey, any good villain." Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you yeah. don't have to play by the rules when you're the villain. That's no. the point. Yeah, yeah. You know what? That's fair. Man, I wish we were doing villains instead because Maleficent is way <laughs> cooler than Aurora. It's so cool. She's so much better than Aurora is. Uh, so Aurora goes into, she's following the creepy voice, following the creepy green. And like, seriously, okay, here's the thing. Here's the thing, royal parents <laughs> out in the world whose daughter has been missing for the last 16 years. When she finally comes home with her fairy godmothers who you have sent her off with to protect her from the crazy, scary green witch lady, Maybe post some guards at the door. Maybe you know, be okay, there to greet her. I just remembered because they bring her home the night of her 16th birthday. Right, right? and wait till the next day. All till the they is had over. to do <laughs> was wait like 12 more hours. <laughs> And it yeah. would have been totally fine. Yes, perhaps Poor Maleficent planning. could have made a spindle appear in the little cottage in the forest because right. her crow finally found out where they were and stuff. Right, right, right. But, like, they were doing pretty good at keeping her safe for 16 years. Why not have her raised by her royal parents for 16 years and then on her 16th birthday be like, hey, we're going out of the country. We're, like, getting on a boat where no <laughs> spindles are allowed. It's it's completely preposterous yeah. it's, to- it's almost as bad as elsa's parents keeping her trapped in her bedroom so that she doesn't <laughs> learn how to control her powers and stuff but we'll get there when we get there but i mean dang yeah yep uh, <laughs> just i was so mad i was like i don't i don't understand yep. i do like the fairy's solution when they decide what they're like oh poor king stefan and the queen they'll be heartbroken and or when they find out and, mm-hmm. and then flora says or yeah flora says well they're not going to find out you know we're going to put them all to sleep i'm like that's a great plan actually yeah because you really are saving them a lot of unnecessary heartache when you cannot fix the problem exactly so and then it turns out i think like the way the fairy tale goes the whole kingdom sleeps for a hundred years right yes in the original in fairy movie, tale it's like an evening uh, yeah <laughs> right? well of, and i mean it for anybody out there who doesn't know this, and I don't know how you don't know this, but I mean, Walt Disney, obviously, and, and like the Disney company took tons of liberties with oh, these yeah. original fairy tales because some of them are wicked, dark, and creepy. Yes. Like I'm about to tell yes. you right now. Um, in the original Sleeping Beauty fairy tale, yes, the entire kingdom is asleep for 100 years and Maleficent has her giant, like, thorny, like, palace over or whatever. Right. Um, and actually, the thorns might not even be there because, so in the original fairy tale, Prince Philip was not betrothed to aurora aurora was asleep in her tower and this prince dude may not have even been a prince just comes <laughs> trotting along on his horse one day sees this giant tower and is like oh i wonder what's in here goes up there sees a sleeping woman and sleeps with her and she has two children by him that is weird yes it is fairy tales man fairy tales are messed up y'all <laughs> but yeah 
Yeah, she definitely gives birth to the prince's children while she is unconscious in her hundredth year of unconsciousness. Oh, that's bad. Yeah, so I can see why Walt Disney took that out. No, totally. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Like, you know what we're going to do? You know what? <laughs> Not going to have that. We'll have the fairies go. And he ends up. And I don't even remember all the ways he ends up like enslaved by. That's right. Philip but, shows but, like, up, imprisoned by. Yeah, Maleficent and he's trying to take care of everything. Um, yeah. Maleficent shows up, throws him into a jail cell, and then right. the three fairies show up. And I remember when we were originally talking about this movie that I had posited that Sleeping Beauty wasn't going to get a whole lot of points because Prince Philip did everything. Right. And then you corrected me and were like, "No, really, it's the fairies the who fairies do, do everything. Everything. And Philip's just kind of along for the ride. He's yep. like, "All right, let's go." You know, he's like Harry Potter. Other more powerful people yes. are taking care of him. Oh. Oh, story-wise, that's a very interesting question. Who is the protagonist of this film? It has to be Flora, Fawn, and Mary. I think it is. It has to be. They They're the ones who move the action all of the along. Action. Yes. They absolutely do. Yeah, because Sleeping Beauty definitely is not. She does No. Uh, no. Mm-mm. No. No. Very interesting. Okay. Well, anyhow. Yeah. So they free him, and then they completely lead the charge. They're just too absolutely. small. They so give he- him, yeah, his sword of truth and his shield of faith and his i don't know boots of righteousness i don't re- <laughs> that's romans yeah <laughs> <laughs> is that romans galatians galatians i no, don't it's, remember i forget <laughs> correct that's bible <laughs> <laughs> not sleeping beauty very different so yeah so he gets all of his stuff and then he runs up and he's like hacking and slashing through all the thorns and then maleficent turns into a giant terrifying scary dragon which is one of the coolest pieces of animation just ever it's so really cool. great and you want to know what makes it the best she doesn't talk because she's a she giant scary dragon talk now. When she's a dragon, no talking. You know what else makes it the best? What's that? The fact that the animator of that particular sequence, the director of that sequence, was a fighter pilot who was like, "Action is my thing. Give this to me." This is okay. I feel really bad because this movie not that great. All of the background stuff it's of so this cool. movie is some of the most right? amazing stuff I've ever I heard. I so wish neat. that we were grading that instead, right? yeah. but we are not. <laughs> It's true. So Philip, what, slingshots his sword into the dragon's chest or whatever? Basically, he, yeah, He, like, yeah, just yeah. chucks it. Do the fairies, like, shoot it forward with no, the magic? What, okay. The, the fairies do a spell so that the aim is true. So that when he... Okay, yeah, sh- yeah, sure. Yeah, so that when he throws it, it'll strike her through the heart. Yeah. All right, great. So he strikes her through the heart. She falls off the cliff, falls to her death. Right. This is the second Disney villain, Disney princess villain that we've seen fall to her death. Uh, yes, the yes. evil queen of Snow White did the same right? thing. Lady uh-huh. Tremaine just... Nothing really happened to her. No, she didn't die. She no. just Oh, you know. Lucifer the cat fell to his death. Lucifer the cat <laughs> totally did fall to his they death. They killed the cat in that film. Dang. Absolutely. Yeah. Maybe he landed on his feet. You don't no, know. <laughs> that cat is super dead. That cat is very dead. Fair enough. Okay. <laughs> um, so then Prince Philip gets to the tower. He runs up. He sees Aurora there. He kisses her. True love's kiss after right. five minutes of Which conversation. Which is also another beautiful piece of animation. It really because is. Because she's looking lovely. very pale. He mm-hmm. kisses her and all the color comes back to her. And it's very... It, it is like a like a book illustration. It doesn't look cartoonish. Right. You know? It's it really was, beautiful. Yes. I think if I remember right that that scene looks more like it was all... Because whenever you look at these old cartoons, you can see where somebody was doing um, the animation of the characters and the background is all painted and yes. it's still. And so like if you're walking along and you see different colored rocks, you're like, oh, those rocks are going to fall because those are animated differently oh, than all the rocks in the background. Yes. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. If I remember this scene correctly, then it's all hand painted except for like her eyes yes. actually and open. open. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But all the right. rest of it is very much like a, yeah. a painted still shot yeah. rather than this animation thing that's going through. And it's so beautiful. she wakes up, the palace wakes up, they get together, they're singing, they're kissing, they're dancing, the dress changes from blue to pink and right. the clouds appear and they do all this stuff and then they live happily ever after. That, that was, was the, it. Yeah, that it, was all, it. it happened really quickly. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Very fast. Yep. The kings were happy. Yeah, finally. Those guys were I old. actually liked the kings. They were they really were, cute. <laughs> talk about it but isn't there at one point where like the guy who plays the lute is like wicked drunk yes. under the dining table <laughs> yes like, i get you lute player dude <laughs> <laughs> you got these two like world powers like arguing about their children and just, like whatever i'm here to party <laughs> good times all around absolutely so that was sleeping beauty so Anything else before we get to uh, grading I'm our ready to grade princess this girl. here? Let's okay. see what happens. Yeah. All right. So she spent half the movie asleep. How good can it be? First, she was an infant. <laughs> then she was whining. Well, no. <laughs> then she sang pretty. Then she was whining. Right. Then she was asleep. Not to show our hand here, but. 
Well, we do need. I, up. I don't even think she has a line. No, she probably not. Her parents. She has like what ten total lines in this entire it's, film. Yeah. It's a little ridiculous. Um, but just as a reminder, we are unfortunately not grading the super cool background of this no, movie itself. We're not. We're Although also. It was fun to talk about those things. Yes, and I'm very, mm-hmm. very glad that you told me all those things because it really was legitimately fascinating. We are also not grading the film as a whole. We right. are only grading Aurora. Only Aurora. Only Aurora. So the go. first thing on a scale of one to five, with one being nothing and five being exceptional, um, autonomy. How much autonomy did Aurora have? How often did she make her own decisions? Oh, gosh. Autonomy. Zero. Zero times. A one. Yeah. She gets a one. Yeah. I don't I mean she made one choice the whole film, which was to come back and tell her aunties that like she's in love with this guy and then she went and cried that on a bedside. That was a choice. She just got home. Yeah, she just did it and was just telling them about her day. <laughs> yeah, no, I completely agree. Uh we could probably even if we really wanted to give her like a point five. Like we probably shouldn't give zeros if we can avoid it. Okay. All right, point five. Point, then. Five. point five. Half a point in autonomy. Okay. What about attitude? This girl was bland as white rice, right? Well, no, she was a whiner and a oh, drama okay. queen. That's true. She was cute when she met the prince, but as soon as I she mean, got home, of. she was a drama queen, I thought. I, like, like in my mind, this girl is a blank slate. You can apply anything to her because I don't remember anything about her except that she sang pretty and she was a bit of a drama queen, like you said, so, but wasn't really... I mean, she was and kind she to her animal friends sulky when they got back to the castle. That's true. Remember? She, she did, just like wouldn't even say anything. She and went into like a spiraling, deep sixteen-year-old depression. I don't like her. I don't really either. One, One. yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, animal companions. Okay, I have a question: Are the animal companions going to be the like the owl who was like her prince, who, and the, and then the little bunnies in the boots that were dancing? Are those the animal companions? Are we going to go ahead and give it to the fairies because the fairies are not human? Here's my argument. We call it animal companion because we've got this alliteration thing going exactly. on here with autonomy, right. attitude, animal companion, attire, right. aria, and apocalypse. Exactly. Um, because of later films where we have things like uh, Olaf the Snowman, I am willing to say that the animal companion doesn't need to be an animal, just right. needs to be a non-human. Okay. So fairies. Okay. Fairies. They're dumb but super powerful, except for Meriwether, who kind of is a little bit. Sm- I mean, like they they knew what was going on. They pushed yeah. the story forward. It's just like we said, like they are basically the protagonists really of the story. I really like the fairies. Yeah, they are the protagonists. I found them very entertaining. Mm-hmm. I loved their relationship with one another. They were right. kind of like the Golden Girls. They were a little bit. And when I say dumb, I just mean like how did these girl, how did these fairies raise this girl for sixteen years and not even you can't even bake a cake. I can bake a cake. Right. I am not a baker by any. Yeah. Sort. Your ten year old daughter can bake a cake. <laughs> you know. Ah, uh, those sweet dumb fairies those sweet dumb fairies <laughs> um i'm willing to give them a four me too I okay a great four is good Excellent. a five's too much a three's too little i agree okay. okay attire so we're talking about her peasant dress and then also her princess dress was it pink or blue sarah all of okay here's the situation every disney princess merchandising thing uh, has pink sleeping beauty in pink okay but at the end of the film it was blue right i think it was pink at the very end actually okay they wanted it to be blue. it looked better blue it did look better blue so now we're dealing with pink and as my daughter called it obnoxiously pink it was just like ariel's dress and little mermaid which yeah. is gonna be unfortunate when we get there um, anyway i mean i do like the design of it and i like her peasant dress Oh, Neither of them have ever really stuck yeah. with me forever. So uh, is it like three? a one or a two? Oh, a three even? Yeah, I guess three is uh, kind of neutral. We'll go with three if it's the blue 2. dress. 2.5 is true neutral. 2.5 is true neutral. Okay. Next, her aria, her singing. I quite liked her voice. I her don't voice remember really any beautiful. of her songs. Once Upon a Dream is her song. Mm-hmm. I I Know You, I Walked With You, Once Upon a Dream. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's really quite lovely. She has a beautiful voice. Is that the only song in the whole movie? Well, there's the King's Drinking Song. Uh-huh. And then when they first get there, there's the, you know, Hail to the King, Hail to the Queen, Hail to mm-hmm. Princess Aurora. And then there's the big, like, Perry Como background singers doing the one gift, the gift of song. Right, okay. So, so a lot in the first half, but not yeah. almost none in the no, second it's, half, it's except not, whenever they get married and then the chorus jumps yeah. up again. It's it's like orchestra heavy. Okay, but, but like her not, song, her one song is Once Upon a Dream, Once right? Upon a Dream. 
I would be comfortable with giving it like a three. That's what I'm thinking. Okay, three. I mean, I personally like it, Mm -hmm. but I can also objectively look at it and know that it's not that great. Yeah, I just like waltzes. That's totally fine. No, yeah, you're. I know that you are. Yeah, when they they waltz right in front of the pond and their reflection is on the bottom too. Super pretty. Yes, I completely agree. Okay, and then our final wild card category: How would Princess Aurora do? In the zombie apocalypse. Are the fairies present? Oh, that is a very good question. It's really the only question. It's really the only question. Okay, so <laughs> let's look at... Uh, let's look, Okay, so... You know what? I, I don't I, think I she think, can I be. Think, no. Yeah, yeah, no. I, I don't think, think it they has are. to just be her. It has to just be the princess. So how would Aurora deal with a zombie apocalypse she I would think she would just like cry in a hole yeah, somewhere right yeah she just go Which, find it to be fair legitimate response to a zombie apocalypse not a helpful one or mm. a necessarily you know useful what she's one. really good at though hiding nope the fairies hid her she was terrible at hiding she told a guy that she had known for three minutes where she lived oh yeah and he was really <laughs> creepy too she gets a this one girl's right going down one yeah one yep. you're not helpful sorry you sing pretty girl Okay, our final score is a 12 for Princess Aurora. Oh, that's worse than Snow White, isn't it? Yes, it it really is. So right now we are up to uh, Snow White with a 16.5 out of 30, Uh which frankly was way higher than I was ever expecting for Snow White. She was a sweet girl. She was very sweet, and she made a lot of her own choices, (laughs) frankly. And they were good choices, generally, except for when she took the poison apple from the Wicked Witch. Right. Um, But that's why she didn't get a five. She was hangry. She was very hangry. (laughs) I've been there, Snow. I know what's up. <laughs> Cinderella got a 25 out of 30, which again, she's awesome and amazing. really high, her. way yes. higher than I personally was expecting. But yeah, Aurora with a whopping 12, wow. the lowest That's by tough. far that we have yeah. on here. Um, that is really interesting because, yeah, honestly, when we first started talking about this project, I thought that Snow White was just hands down going to get the lowest score. Oh, yeah. But mm-hmm. it turns out that in my brain, I didn't even think about Sleeping Beauty. Yeah. Like, she was so low on my <laughs> list of priorities. Didn't even occur to me in my yeah. brain. So, wow. Yeah. That is crazy. So, the next one that we're doing, then, is The Little Mermaid. Is that right? <gasps> It is, because this is when there was the long silence for Disney movies before the Disney Renaissance, and Mm -hmm. then we head into Little Mermaid. Right. Oh, that's fascinating. That'll be interesting to watch that one again, because that's one again that I grew up on. Yes. But I haven't seen Start to Finish, I don't think, as an adult. I, okay, Maybe. and and I don't want to show too much of my hand before this next episode, but um, The Little Mermaid was my favorite Disney princess for a long time. Right. Like I said, these were the You're first wearing song. on your I shirt. I am, right literally, the sweater moment. that I'm wearing. Yeah. This is also the first time that Liz and I have been able to get together and record and not just Skype, and it's been super pleasant, really great. That's true, very fun. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, but, I mean, the songs from The Little Mermaid were the first songs I ever learned in my entire life. So, like, Ariel was my oh, girl yeah. until 2010 when, when Rapunzel showed you, up. And you were a 19-year-old young woman. Yes, I was. Your bedroom was like plastered, all covered. Little Mermaid, yes, and even the paint was like Little Mermaid green. Yes, it was, it was amazing. Yep, yeah, but that was before like you knew me and knew about like my excruciating <laughs> love for things. Right. So right. I, mean, I just I'd... thought you excruciatingly loved me, but then I realized no, it's, it's many everything, things. <laughs> all the things, <laughs> which actually was a bit of a relief at that. Oh, moment. good. I'm glad. Yeah, I can see how. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, because you were what 23 at the time. Yes. I can see how. This nine-year-old who attaches herself to you like a barnacle <laughs> would be a little disconcerting. Um, but yeah, I actually have seen The Little Mermaid again in my adult life, and um, I'm really excited, but also really embarrassed. <laughs> so we will see how that goes, but I'm very much looking forward to it. It'll we be will- fun. Thank you. Yes, yes, I think so, too. Um, and thank all of you for uh, sticking with us through this. Yeah. Um, thanks for joining us on this amazing auditory adventure. We are having just the best time. If you guys want to get in touch with us and talk about your thoughts on Sleeping Beauty and try to convince us why she's um, a good princess at all. You know, sometimes you just love something and like there's nostalgia and there's subjectivity. I am absolutely ready to hear those stories. Absolutely. You guys can get in touch with us on Twitter using the hashtag DPDM. Disney Princess Deathmatch. That's exactly right. Liz, good job. I think that Deathmatch is technically one word, but we are separating that out. Not on Twitter. It's not. (laughs) So hashtag DPDM. You can get in touch with us at Common Room Cast on Twitter. Uh-huh. You can get in touch with me personally at Elsa Grab the Salt. And if that doesn't tell you what my favorite Disney movie is now, then I don't know what will. <laughs> 
And I'm Lizbeth Ray 555. You can also get in touch with us uh, by sending us an email to podcast at commonroomradio.com. Uh-huh. And that'd be super cool. Do that. Uh, I'm recording this from the past. It's the future now. <gasps> and the I bet. The future is now. The future is now. And I bet I'm working really hard. So it'd be super cool if you could just shoot an email being like, hey, I hope that kitchen work is going well and I love you and you're great. <laughs> um, you don't have to do that thing. We can cut all that if we need to. Whatever. Anyway, so thank you guys so much. And uh, we will see you next week. I'm Sarah Kane. And I'm Liz Stevens. Bye! I'm a train! Oh, I'm a I have got to get contact lenses because these headphones press my uh, oh, glasses no, up against no. my head and it kills me and I want to die.